I'm in. I'm ready. Good afternoon. My name is Noemi Herzig. I am the Director of Jewish Cultural Arts and Education at the JCC in Ann Arbor. This promises to be another great program of conversations with our host, Chuck Newman, tonight, uh, this afternoon. Just a few housekeeping items. We are recording this session. We activated the closed caption feature. Click on the CC icon on the bottom of your screen if you would like us to, if you would like to use it. All attendees are muted. Please use the chat feature to send in your questions. The views expressed by Chuck Newman and his guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Ann Arbor JCC. All previous conversation recordings, including this one, will be at the JCC webpage at jccannarbor.org. And now it is my pleasure to call on Charles Newman. Thank you, Noemi, and a special thank you because Noemi today is, has interrupted her trip to Brazil to uh, facilitate our meeting this afternoon. And thank all of you for attending, and especially thank our guests, of course, Heather Booth. And uh, those of you who have attended before know that I'm not big on uh, listing all the credentials of my guests, but I'm gonna make an, uh, an exception, and by no means are these all the credentials of our guests, because I don't want her to be known as a one trick pony. It's a terrific trick she has, but she has many tricks. So these are just some of the things that Heather has done in her career. Uh, she started organizing in civil rights, anti-Vietnam War and the women's movement in the 1960s. She started Jane, which of course we'll be talking about, an underground abortion service in 1965 before Roe. She was the founding director of the Midwest Academy, which we're gonna talk about as well. Uh, I find this fascinating and potentially very useful for, for us and uh, for many of you who are already organizers or could and should become organizers. In 2000, she was the director of the NAACP National Voter Fund. I'm not through. Uh, she was a lead consultant directing the founding of the Campaign for Comprehensive Immigration Reform in 2005. In 2008, she was director of the health care campaign for the AFL-CIO. In 2009, she directed the campaign passing President Obama's first budget. In 2010, Heather was the founding director of Americans for Financial Reform, fighting to regulate the financial industry. She's also been the national coordinator for the coalition, coalition around marriage equality and the 2013 Supreme Court decision. Heather was strategic advisor to the Alliance for Citizenship, the largest coalition of the immigration reform campaign. And finally, for now, uh, field director for the 2017 campaign to stop the tax giveaways to millionaires and billionaires. Uh, Heather. What's a typical day for you? <laughs> well, for one thing, it is a day filled with gratitude that I can be with people like you. Chuck, thank you. both thank you for hosting the show. Naomi, thank you for organizing us and, and providing a framework, but mostly for the extraordinary people on this call. I understand there were 269 people signed up for the call and there'll be others who are seeing it tonight and at other times, because in many ways, the future of our democracy, our country, freedoms that we keep struggling for and to advance are literally in your hands. You are among the people who will shape our future, especially now, just a few weeks out from an election that really will be and can be a historic election because we face a moment that's on a knife's edge between tyranny and an expansion of the freedoms we want to see. I'll come back to that a little later, but to the question right. you asked, Charles, you yeah. said, what's an average day like? Um, I, I can already tell, this is going to be one of my easiest interviews ever. I don't think I'm going to have to ask many questions at all. Yes, uh, Heather, what's a typical day like for you? Well, I often wake up 
and talk to my kids and sometimes my grandkids. Here's a picture of, of the grandkids on the, on, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Oh. My grandkids, they're much older now. That's an earlier picture. I exercise. In fact, I've just recently had some foot surgery as many of us in our third act in our, uh, at our my current age, <laughs> exercise, try and take care of ourselves. And then I get into the work of the day. You are really so key to the work of the day of this era, not just for Michigan, as important as that is. And you have on the ballot, not only one of the most important governor's races in the entire country, someone who's been hounded by the right wing, whose life has been threatened by the MAGA Republicans, but also this constitutional amendment to preserve, extend the question of the most intimate freedom in a person's life, the freedom to decide when or whether or with whom we have a child and not let a politician get in the middle of that decision. So the decisions you're gonna make in Michigan matter a great deal, but they also matter for us around the country. And the main message that I share with you now and may repeat throughout this uh, Zoom show is that when we organize, we have changed this world. And when you organize now, when you vote, when you get others to vote, when you volunteer, when you're active, when you make phone calls, when you do texts, when you go door to door, when you talk to your neighbors, when you take action, we'll change this world for the better. I've heard motivational speeches by football coaches that don't come close to what you, I'm fired up, Heather, and thank you for, for uh, giving us that very important message and motivation. You know, one of the ways that we're going to get people involved beyond the circle of folks who are on this session is at a uh, free movie that we're gonna be showing this coming Monday in Ann Arbor at the Michigan Theater. Uh, starring Sigourney Weaver and uh, Elizabeth Banks. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and uh, could you, Drew, or you know, Amy, put the link in chat for that, uh, to register for that movie. And those of you who are on this session, share that with uh, your friends and neighbors. We have, it's a 1700 seat capacity theater. So we don't have to worry about people uh, being turned away at the door. Let's get that thing filled up. And we're going to have an afterglow afterwards. And we're going to have representatives from the Reproductive Freedom for All ballot initiative and, and other organizations. So uh, help us share that link. Um, how young Can I say you something when... more about the movie? Oh, and, and uh, Paula says it's free. <laughs> Free, Should free, I free. say something about the movie or about the group for people who don't know what it is, what Jane was? Sure, we can talk about Jane now. Um, all right, what's it about? Well, the movie you've described, Call Jane, is a uh, slightly fictional version of an underground abortion service that existed uh, starting in the 1960s that I founded. There's another movie, by the way, that's available currently on HBO, and the name of that is The Janes. The reason we called the underground Jane was because in 1965, three people talking about providing an abortion was a conspiracy to commit a felony. And so we'd take out ads and say, pregnant don't wanna be called Jane and provide a number as opposed to one of our own names. The documentary tells the very factual story, the one on HBO, and that's named The Janes. The Sigourney Weaver one, uh, we, we think by the way, both might be nominated for Academy Awards, <laughs> uh, is a culturally accurate story. But I'll tell you what the real story was about how it started. Please do. In, in many ways, this, the origin really goes back to the civil rights movement where I began my work. In 1964, when I was 18, I went to Mississippi with the Freedom Summer Project. Many of you on this call may remember the Freedom Summer Project. 
It's where Northern students were recruited to go to Mississippi to shine a spotlight on the terror in which African-Americans were living, uh, especially if they wanted to register and vote. And by the way, knowing this is sponsored by the JCC, Jews in that effort were well overrepresented. I'm Jewish and in part came because of the values that I was brought up to believe in, justice, justice thou shalt pursue. And the summer project gained notoriety when three of the young volunteers, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, were killed at the hands of the Klan. And I often point out that it's not surprising that two of the three volunteers were Jewish because Jews were so disproportionately represented in you know, being only about 2% of the population, but overrepresented in causes of social justice, at least in those times. But because people organized within a year, even in the face of that terror, we won a Voting Rights Act. And I won, I, I learned incredibly important lessons. The most important was that if you organize, if you take action, even in the face of horrendous circumstances, frightening circumstances, you can win, but you have to organize. A second lesson I learned is that you have to stand up to illegitimate authority. When I was 18 years old, I was simply holding up a sign, freedom now, while people were registering to vote. And I was arrested. I wasn't doing civil disobedience. I actually thought I was following what we thought democracy was. But you stand up to illegitimate authority and you organize and you change the world. I returned to my campus at the University of Chicago in 1965 and a friend of mine told me his sister was pregnant and nearly suicidal, not ready to have a child. Now, this was a time, some of you may remember, in 1965, we barely talked about sex with other people in public, let alone abortion. I didn't recall ever discussing it. I didn't really know anything much about it. But as an act of goodwill, as a caring for a friend who was in need, as following the golden rule, I said I'd try and do what I could. And I went to the medical arm of the civil rights movement, the Medical Committee for Human Rights. And I found a doctor, someone remarkable, T.R.M. Howard. You probably don't know his name, but you, you should. He was a um, courageous civil rights leader in Mississippi. I didn't know this at the time. Who came, who's, who stood up for the investigation about the murder of Emmett Till. And there's another movie that I'm looking forward to seeing called Till about the murder of this young child who had come to Mississippi to visit his aunt. So uh, Dr. Howard's name appeared on a Klan death list once he stood up for that and he came to Chicago. Well, Dr. Howard said he would perform the procedure for my friend and I thought that was it. I thought this was a one-off, I had done a good deed and I didn't really think much more about it, but word spread and someone else called. I made the arrangement again with Dr. Howard and then word spread and someone else called. And at that point, I realized I better set up a system. We need to organize. The system so attracted others. And while there's much more to the story, over time, perhaps a hundred women a week were coming through what we call the service. And so many were coming through, the women themselves who were in the service, who were in Jane, learned how to do the procedures. And the women of Jane themselves performed 11,000 abortions between 1965 and 1973, when on January 22nd, Roe became the law of the land. And we were able to change that law because we could challenge illegitimate authority and because we organized. And the what same was, is needed now. Without question. Um, how safe were the abortions that you provided? They were illegal. They were not done in, out in the open. How safe were they? You know, it's interesting. Because the women of Jane wanted to create what in, SNCC and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, we called a beloved community. We were doing it out of love and caring. 
And it wasn't out of healthcare with a for-profit system, which much of healthcare is now. And because it was the only thing that was being done, the procedures were actually safer than they are even when they're done in a, a larger medical facility. In fact, after Roe became the law, there was a study of what was the uh, impact of the procedures done through Jane and those done in a, reticle, um, in a medical facility and the success rate, the efficiency, effective rate was even higher with Jane. So this was a beloved community done not for profit. In fact, we negotiated the price down that if you, abortions at those times initially cost $500. We then negotiated two for the price of one, three for the price of one. Oh, you have no money at all? Come on anyway. And there was some fee because we had our own expenses but it was a beloved community. Uh, the Janes operated for quite a while. Uh, they couldn't have been a, a total secret from the police uh, and the neighbors. Why do you think it was allowed to continue even though it was illegal? Several reasons for that. First of all, over time, among the people who came through were wives, or mistresses of police, or people who were working for the police force themselves. We knew the police knew about it. In fact, at one point, my husband and I, um, so I was in Jane, I was also doing labor and other organizing. My husband was uh, active as Al Haber knows, Al was the founder of SDS and my husband was the national secretary of Students for a Democratic Society, the leading youth organization in the anti-war movement. And the, uh, we were living with two other friends to raise our kids together. Al Raby, who was the head of the uh, civil rights movement in Chicago when Dr. King came to Chicago, and Pat Novick, uh, who also was part of Jane and, and a number of other activities. And we had a police car outside of our house who was part of what was called in the Chicago Police Department, the Red Squad, <laughs> because they were investigating people who they thought they said had subversive activities, which we really thought meant, meant we were for civil rights, human rights, and democracy. You might not have been wrong. And we said that the police got four for the price of one. So to your question, uh, Charles, we believe the police knew about it, but what was particularly different was this wasn't a partisan political effort to oppose this most intimate freedom in a person's life. As I said, the freedom to decide when or whether to have a child, a freedom that is supported by nearly 80% of the population who believe that no politician should come between a woman and her physician on this decision. And so for this very popular issue, it wasn't politicized, but what happened in the late 80s, 1980s, is that Paul Weyrich and a number of people on the right wing, now out of the MAGA part of the Republican party, made a deal, kind of a devil's compact with portions of various religious communities, some evangelical and others, and basically said the right wing of the Republican party who didn't particularly care about abortion, they cared about ensuring that there would be no taxes on the ultra wealthy, that there could be uh, no climate laws so that you could uh, pollute the environment and make whatever profit you wished from your, from your companies. So they had other concerns, but the right wing of the Republican party made a deal and said, they would provide the funding and the political apparatus if some of these churches would provide the people to come out on issues they cared about that included abortion and um, gay and lesbian, LGBT uh, freedoms in the country and marriage uh, and birth control. The very issues that we now hear might be considered by the Supreme Court. 
And so the issue, Charles, is that in that time, it was illegal. There were women still dying from injury done to themselves. There were septic abortion wards in hospitals where people were, who, who had uh, infections from abortions they tried on themselves or that others inflicted on them. But that's because it was illegal, but it wasn't treated as the level of, um, this freedom had not been taken away in the same way that it's being threatened now. Uh, interestingly enough, and this is before Roe versus Wade was struck down, I, I ran across this number. In 2015 alone, Google had more than 700,000 searches for self-induced abortions. So, um, and that was before, before Roe versus Wade was struck down. Uh, I don't know, should we give away the, the ending to the movie? Uh, should I ask you what happened? Uh, to, to, what? Come, come see a movie. So um, you er, earlier you said that um, um, there was a disproportionate number of Jews of, involved in the civil rights movement. Do you think your Jewish upbringing has influenced your life uh, career? Oh, you know, everything we are is influenced by who we are. I was brought up in Bensonhoist. I grew up in a loving family. I'm white. I'm now 77 years old. All of these things affect me. In a horror. <laughs> and the Jewish values that I was brought up with mattered a lot. In fact, you know, we just celebrated the beginning of a Jewish New Year. And on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of our year, we quote Isaiah as saying, um, when we fast, and I fasted for, the, for uh, starting with Kol Nidre the, on the Jewish New Year. He says, is this the fast I command of you? to sit in sackcloth and ashes, to show you're a, a penitent, holy person. And he says, no, what I command of you is to break the yoke of wickedness and let the oppressed go free. This is an activist religion. It's an activist faith, an activist tradition. And it's those elements that I absorbed as a child and still try and carry forward. And I also would say it's very precious. There was about a 30 year span where social justice moved away from being at the heart of Judaism and it was reinvigorated. I actually was hired by, some people may remember Leonard Fine Label Fine, who started Moment Magazine and the Jewish Literacy Project, and Rachel Cowan, who uh, worked to fund a number of these efforts. And they hired me to help reinstill social justice into the heart of the Jewish community. And many other efforts developed like that, including the JCC, uh, vitality of a social justice agenda now. But all I would say is that it is precious having social justice as a core of our tradition. And it's something that needs to be nurtured generation to generation. All credit to your parents and all credit to you. Do you think you pass that along to your children? They are so wonderful. One is a, a teacher. I view a public school teachers are amongst the frontline pioneers for uh, justice and democracy or can be. And we need to support them and not be attacking them. And the other is a, a version of a public interest lawyer. Uh, so I think they've passed them on. By the way, my, my first cousin, Deborah DeJour, uh, and her husband, Tom, live in Ann Arbor and I think are quite active uh, both at the Jewish oh, yeah. Film Festival and the JCC. And we all share uh, this shared tradition. Uh, you mentioned two movies, The Janes and Call Jane. There's another movie 
Heather Booth changing the world. You're the only person I know who's had three movies made about them and their life's work. It's, but but you were worthy of three movies. How can they see the uh, the the uh, Heather Booth changing the world movie? Do you have any idea? It's on. If I pardon me for saying it, it's on Amazon. Uh, there's also a website called Heather Booth the Film. And the film came out about five years ago. It came out just after uh, Trump was elected. And I took it around the country. In fact, uh, it was showed, I think, Bernie Bannett, I think, is on this Zoom call. Oh, absolutely. And he, I think, helped to organize a showing of it uh, in Ann Arbor maybe four years ago. But I'm sure Bernie has better <laughs> recollection than I do. Um, and it's a film about a life in organizing. And it says that when we organize, we have changed this world, giving lots of examples. And if we organize now, we will change this world. And I just remind people, when that film came out, Trump had just been elected. It was as if a terror was being enacted on us taking away so many of our freedoms, even of the decency of society. And many people had given up hope. And the film was designed to say, but if we organize, we can change this world. And sure enough, we did organize and we have been changing this world. I did the progressive and seniors outreach for the Biden campaign and we saw the results. Biden got more, more votes than anyone has ever gotten in an election. And just think about the changes that we've made. We just passed this Inflation Reduction Act. It means that for senior citizens, the maximum out-of-pocket cost will be $2,000 for prescription drugs. I have a friend who was paying almost $100,000 a year for a cancer medication. It now will be reduced to $2,000. A friend taking insulin who was paying $600 a month will now pay a maximum of $35. And we force the prescription drug companies to negotiate with us so that there are changes. It's been the greatest investment in climate that has ever happened in the country's history. And there are other changes. So I just say, even when times seem rough, even when it seems nearly hopeless, we have changed this world when we organize. And it's the key to changing this world now for what you do, who you talk to, the letters you write, the statements you make, the tweets you send, the talking to people door to door, and the holding of forums like this, Charles and the JCC. We're gonna get into more about effective organizing, but I have one last question regarding reproductive freedom. Well, what suggestions do you have for groups that are working for reproductive rights now after the Dobbs decision? Well, first, thank you, thank you. And we need to do things to support you and you need things to support yourselves. The increased demand on your own work has now just gone up astronomically. I spoke to a friend who is uh, at a clinic who used to have 150 patients um, a week. And now they have, they were having 500 a week because people are coming from other states into what we're calling sanctuary states. There are about 26 states that have currently banned completely or nearly banned uh, abortion. Um, so one is to give each other comfort and support, build that beloved community. We do need to support those centers. But I often say there are at least four things we need to do. Four M's, you can remember it as four M's. There's members, we need to recruit people. How many people are you gonna to recruit to work in the election? Now, I mean, not only just vote, we certainly expect you're gonna vote, but we hope you will volunteer. Will you make calls on election day and building up to it? Will you text? Will you go door to door for those who can? Will you hold up signs? Will you do whatever the work is that's it? Will you provide food? So members, will you recruit others to do the work? We need more people doing the work. Secondly, as message, we need to spread the word just as you're doing on this podcast or this um, 
this program that you're having, uh, just as you're doing when you talk to others, just as you'll have on Naomi and others will have at the JCC and other uh, organizational events. Three is money. We need to give money, raise money. You may not have a lot, but just think of all the things we spend money on. This also will take money. I just was told that the Republican Party is putting in 55, I'm gonna check that number. I'm sorry, 5.5, 5.5 million dollars into Michigan in the last three weeks of the election, in part to defeat Governor Whitmer and in part to defeat this constitutional amendment. We need our money too. And then the last M is movement. We need to show up. So members, recruit people, do the work yourselves, message, send the message, uh, provide the funding uh, and raise the funds. And we're not saying everyone's wealthy, but whatever we have, and then movement. And we support each other in building a movement, which I often call a movement with love at the center. I even, I wanted to show you something. When I was in the Biden campaign, I made up these buttons for the people who were my, I had an enormous volunteer corps and I made up buttons for each of them. And one said, organize. And the other said, love at the center. I'm just showing it to you to say, I'm not just saying it on this call. I really believe we need to organize with love at the center. Inspiring. To uh, amplify your efforts, you started the Midwest Academy in Chicago, which has trained over 25,000 grassroots activists and hundreds of organizations and coalitions. Uh, tell us a little bit about that initiative. In 1973, many of the movements of the 60s were were dissipating. Others were developing women's movement, public interest movement, but many of the movements of the 60s were dissipating, some from outside forces, some from self-inflicted wounds. And it was a confusing time about what we did. So we started a training center that taught the skills of organization, skills like how do you have a meeting? How do you speak in public? How do you raise money? How do you talk to an elected official? The second was, how do you develop a strategy? How do you figure out what to do when you don't know what to do? And a center piece of the Midwest Academy training is to teach strategic planning. And the third was to understand the context of our organizing. What are the economics, the racial politics, the other politics, gender politics, how do, what's the context of the period we're finding ourselves in? And it's really an extraordinary training. The um, uh, email for it, the website is www.midwestacademy.com. I see uh, Rosanita Ratcliffe wrote in and said, it's great training. <laughs> Sounds like she is. Good, good. No, Amy or Drew, could you get that into chat as well? Do you need it repeated? Would you mind repeating that, Heather? Yeah, please uh, repeat. It's, it's www.midwestacademy.com. By the way, Carolyn Hedgecall just wants to remind people that there are other things on the ballot too. And Carolyn just reflects my own uh, not knowing enough on Michigan that I didn't emphasize proposal two which would uh, prevent the election deniers from determining the outcome of the elections. And this is also crucially important. We should be voting up and down the ballot. And when you talk to people, when you go door to door or make the calls, and I'm hoping everyone here signs up for those shifts, that you remind people to vote up and down the ballot and on proposal two, and on the constitutional amendment. I understand there's an interesting story as to where the seed money came from uh, for the Midwest Academy. Do you recollect where it did? Oh. 
at that time, this was 1973, I was in grad school. I had two little kids. We really had almost no money. And I had a job that actually treated me very well, but it treated all the clerical staff, which were, who were all African-American, very poorly. And I came into work one day and one of the clerical staff was crying when I asked her what was up. She said her paycheck had just been cut. And it was cut because she was told that the woman who sat next to her was gonna become her supervisor and therefore needed a pay increase. So her pay was cut. She was about to quit and I said, don't quit. Let's just go in. This employer is reasonable. He was a, a very prominent liberal <laughs> employer. He said, let's go in and just let's raise procedural demands, none were financial demands, but they were, is there a process for reviewing if someone has a concern? What's the sick pay, uh, sick leave policy? What's the, uh, can you take time off if your kids are sick? And we wrote an agreement that was very reasonable, hoped to have a conversation. And the employer said he would agree to all the demands, but I would be fired because I was treating him like GM. I honestly was desperate. We really did not have money. My husband was unemployed at the time. I filed a suit with the National Labor Relations Board. Within three months, everyone who signed that statement was reorganized out of their positions. We all joined in together and it took two and a half years, but we won a National Labor Relations Act um, complaint and won two and a half years back pay and swearing I would never be fired again. Never have been <laughs> uh, because I, I often work for myself. <laughs> Tough boss. We would, uh, we invested and made this group Midwest Academy. And it also underscores the need for unions in our lives. Michigan especially should know that. Part of the reason there's been the rise of a MAGA right wing is because they have the institutional structure of evangelical churches. And the structure that was closest to that in terms of a structure was really trade unions in America. But the assault of the right wing against unions has meant that there's not an organized voice by which people can learn grassroots democracy, learn leadership, learn what it means to unite across racial and regional and cultural lines. And so we're at a disadvantage and part of rebuilding small d democracy is also the rebuilding of trade unions in the United States. Uh, I understand the Midwest Academy provides its uh, services via the internet, correct? You do not have to go to Chicago. Well, we were doing it all in person and then we had two extraordinary co-directors. I no longer really do the training, I'm chair of the board. Um, and they were able to adapt to this Zoom environment. So we're now going to have both in-person and online training. By the way, I see Julia Lipman has said, don't forget to vote for the nonpartisan Supreme Court judges. Absolutely, Bernstein and Bolden. I know JCC is nonpartisan, it's not taking a position, but as an individual, <laughs> I'm encouraging uh, what Julia said. Uh, we do have our activists in Michigan. Michigan, by the way, uh, at one point was, uh, had a very effective Democratic Party here that was basically funded and staffed by the union movement. And when the unions were broke, and I mean figuratively, um, all that infrastructure went away. And um, we, we can rebuild that. Right now, unions are more popular than hot dogs in America. Hot dogs are at 70%, unions are at 71%. <laughs> so now is the time. You 70% of what? Uh, that you measure hot dogs? Uh, of the population who believe, who ah, believe that who believe. unionization okay. is, um, is a benefit to people. Yeah, what do you carry forward from the 60s and the feminist uh, movement of uh, Betty Friedan and others? What did you, did you, well, partly did you, look around at this at this call, see how many of us 
are women and men of goodwill. We're in a partnership. We share a sense of we can do this. There is a spirit. We did this once. We can do this again, but only if we organize. And I really think the greatest thing that has changed since the 1960s is that we have changed as a people, as a movement. And we can bring that spirit to bear now. We do need, of course, to be partners with the rising generation, increasing young women of color leading groups like um, uh, Black Lives Matter or the Dreamers, or uh, in where I'm living, there's a fight around one fair wage about equal pay for tipped workers. Again, all of these and other movements led by often young women of color, that is a, is a result of there having been a vital women's movement in this country. Uh, you have worked for and you've advised on specific policy initiatives uh, within and for the Democratic Party. We heard about finance reform, marriage equality, healthcare, immigration reform, tax policies, drug prices. What's your assessment of the Democratic Party of 2022, the challenges and strengths? You know, um, it's a big, sometimes messy and diverse party reflecting a big and messy and diverse country. And so who we are and what we do can shape that future. You know, when I first came into social change work, I actually was very, um, I was not connected with a democratic or any political organization. In fact, I was kind of anti-electoral. I lived in the original Mayor Daley, Chicago, who had said, shoot to kill. I didn't want to be part of that. I lived in, I worked in Mississippi where James Eastland and Stennis were democratic senators and I didn't want to be part of that racist, murderous party. But I learned a lesson, a lesson, taught me in part by a friend of mine, an African-American legislator in Chicago, uh, Alice Palmer, who said, if you don't do politics, politics does you. And the question is, it's not that elections is the only way, but it's a necessary way. What I've come to believe is we need to build our own organizations. We need to be in touch with people 24-7, 365. People have concerns, we need to respond to it, listen to it, and engage others. And then convert the power that we build into electoral power. And part of what's so frightening at this moment is because I think we have not engaged the electoral power. An opposition that fundamentally does not believe in small d democracy is undermining the very tools of electoral power that at least was the vision of a society built with freedom and justice for all, never achieving it. It's a goal we keep having to push forward to, but then pulling away the possibility that election deniers, people who knew they lost this election, then could challenge this election and attack the Capitol in a criminal conspiracy. That's what January 6th is about, those hearings. It's exposing that there was a criminal conspiracy planned for, paid for, and promoted by people who wanted to challenge an election they knew they lost. Well, that has to be opposed. And I believe the most effective ways to oppose it is by building our organizations, by spreading our message, taking the offensive, and then driving the power we have into elections, and then doing that virtuous cycle again, organizing again, sending our message again, building our power again, and driving it again into elections. So I don't believe it ends with elections, but it's a necessary, a necessary component. In mathematics, it's called necessary, but not sufficient. Um, I don't mean to distress people, but I've seen some poll numbers 
And prop three is no sure thing at this point. Uh, we cannot be complacent. And also the percentage of people who have received their absentee ballot, who have returned it, is a small fraction of how many people return their ballots in 2020. There seems to be a lot of apathy out there. And uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to see that people vote. Uh, elections have consequences. Oh my God, do they ever. So uh, those of you, by the way, who come to see the movie, call Jane, you're gonna be given lots of opportunities to uh, do whatever you can, volunteer opportunities to see that people do get out and vote. And those of you who don't come to see the movie, we've got your email address. So you're gonna be given some opportunities as well. And please help us. What are your current causes, Heather? By the way, should we open up for some questions? Do you wanna do uh, that? Yeah, I have not been monitoring them. Do we have lots of good questions, Noemi? I mean, they're all good questions, but... Uh, uh, not really, not many questions. Uh, there's one here that says, did you ever consider running for office yourself? I know that came from my daughter, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a good question. It's a very good question, yes. Then I, I ask, I, I will answer it, but I ask you then, Rachel Newman, have you ever considered running for office yourself? <laughs> because the question is, is it's up to the next generation People should realize that it is possible. We can do this. And you have to find the arena that makes sense for you. For me, I'd say several things. One, I so love what I'm doing that I haven't deeply considered my own running for office because I really love what I'm doing. Two, I think in part, I didn't think of running for office because I think women of my era were not encouraged to run for office. And our, my own insecurity, my own belief that I couldn't do it, I wouldn't know where to start, I wouldn't be good enough, I wouldn't be smart enough, I wouldn't know enough. Everything in the society tells us we're not good enough. You're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not thin enough, you're not tall enough, you're not that, blah, 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 blah. you're not enough. And part of what we need to do is to say to people, you are more than enough. As I think it was Gloria Steinem said, we are the leaders we have been waiting for. And so I hope, Rachel, you consider running for office or others do, and that we all consider supporting people to build the most serious operation, to build our power for a more just, and small d democratic world. I'm not so sure that uh, that I got as complete an answer as perhaps uh, I was looking for. What are your current causes? Oh, I, I didn't answer that one, I'm sorry. Um, right now, I'm doing two major things in terms of my organizing work. One is I'm doing versions of this. I actually say, uh, even tonight, I'm giving another talk. I'd say I do one or two of these talks a day, as well as press talks. It's partly the movie has made it so popular. And also it's an opportunity to talk about the possibilities in the election. And that's the second thing that I'm really doing. I want people to have the confidence that if we organize, we can turn this around. In many ways, the barbarians are at the gate. There is a threat to fundamental democracy. There's a threat to our freedoms. There's a threat on reproductive freedom, on voting, on voting freedom. There's a threat to our economic well-being. The Republicans have said that they want to undo not only the Inflation Reduction Act, which would mean, as I said, $35 a month for insulin. They want to undo that. But just today, um, McCarthy said, he actually wants actions that will lead to the undoing of social security. Fundamental supports of a modern society. But we can do something about it, but if we organize. 
The results already from Georgia, which just had early vote, say that on the first day of, of voting, there's as high, uh, almost twice as high a turnout as there was in the last midterm election. It was something like 80,000 people in the first uh, uh, two years ago, um, four years ago in the last midterm, it was 130,000, something on those, that level of figures. We can get the turnout. And if we turn out, we will win. And I wanna indicate further, and I know I'm not speaking for the JCC, but just for myself. In the Senate, which I know is not really up in, in Michigan, it's not one of the marginal states in Michigan, two more senators, and we can change the rules of the Senate. That would mean you change, you stop the filibuster, which now demands 60 votes in order to pass anything. And the president has already said, we will pass, we will codify Roe, make it the law of the land, and we'll pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Those will happen automatically. They pass the House, just pass the Senate, but we need two more votes to change the rules. We have the majority votes for the substance, but we don't have the majority to change those rules. We win on this Senate and we change those rules if we also hold the House for Democrats. And so it's important, whatever you do in Michigan, there are races you can support with phone calls, with texting, some with volunteering and going there and with funding in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in Arizona, in Nevada, in Maine, in North Carolina, in Florida, and there's some other races too. Colorado, Ohio, states nearby, two more votes. We codify Roe nationally. We pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, but we also have to hold on to the House. So a lot is at stake and we are counting on Michigan. Uh, I have a question. I had a question on my list of questions. I'm not even gonna bother to ask it because I know the answer. And the question was, will you ever retire? And uh, I just don't see that happening somehow. It just, my think, answer is who knows? I just I had know. very- I If you're just breathing, had, you're gonna be well, organizing. First of all, I love what I'm doing. I love time with my grandchildren. And also I'm aging. I don't wanna direct anything anymore. I just recently had pretty severe foot surgery. Here, if you can see, I've got a, I've got a. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. <laughs> no more tap dancing. And so, I'm. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what can I manage, what can I do, and it's also why I'm so excited about another generation that's coming into this work. So and here's. Connect, Here's a question. Um, it was sent, sent directly to me, so I don't know if the person doesn't want me to mention their name, but I don't think there is a problem. But the question is, do you think on some levels you get more accomplished by the works and influence you have by being outside the political arena? I think people in the political arena can also have enormous influence. If Joe, I originally supported Elizabeth Warren for president. But the day that it was clear she could not be the candidate, she would not be the nominee, I called up the Biden campaign and offered my services. They accepted, actually much to my surprise, that Joe Biden is president means we are able to move forward because there is a movement on the outside and people on the inside who are willing to work together, sometimes with tension, sometimes with challenges, but move together and move forward, both matter. When I lived in Chicago, my, my uh, member of Congress is Jan Schakowsky. She is a dynamo. She makes things happen. And so I, and she started as an organizer of senior citizens. She came through the second class of Midwest Academy. She's an organizer. Yes, Sharon Baseman, I love Sharon, said, uh, love Jan Schakowsky. So I think it's, it's not the exact position you have. It's not even whether or not you are a specific organizer. If you do cultural work, do that work, you write the poetry, you do the art, you write the stories, 
you do the uh, programs, you work for the JCC, you do organizing. What matters is that we think about building our numbers, spreading the message, raising the funds, and building the movement. Okay, there, there's an interesting question here, if you don't mind. Uh, so, let's do the last one. Okay, John Bandor asked, in 1970, I co-founded the Women's Crisis Center. We drove women to safe and legal abortions in New York, over 400 per year. If mission becomes a sanctuary state, what should we be doing to support the availability of medical and surgical abortions? Well, first of all, the main, thank you, first of all, Jan, for what you've done before. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for being on this call. You obviously, you will know better what to do than I will because you live in Michigan, you've done this work. You should advise us. What I think is that what? we see where the we see where the need is. We support those who are doing the work and we provide support. Legal support is needed, legislative changing the laws providing the organizing, involving more people and building our political power, as well as supporting those centers. You know, Planned Parenthood was the largest healthcare provider for women, period, in the United States. Abortion was less than 5%, I think even less of all their work, but they're being closed down now because they were providing this procedure for women. And we need to support them. There are many other groups. There's a national abortion funds. Most of abortions now are provided by medicine abortion, by two pills you can take. Most of the abortions, by the way, are, are for women who already have children. So they know what it means to bring a child into this world and they know when they're ready or not ready for it. So I just ask you, I realize we're winding up. Maybe, I don't know, Charles, maybe there's time for one more comment, but. No. <laughs> What's most important is that we each do what we can, where we can, as we can, and then we do even more and have the confidence to know that we can build a more hopeful future and we can be agents of hope. And I guess that my last thought is the worst legacy of this period would be if people lose hope that we can build a better future, that we have a diminished belief that we can make it better, even against enormous odds. It's why I start with the story of the murderous time in a civil rights movement. But we may change when people like you and our numbers magnified when we organized. So thank you all. Thank you so much. You honored us with uh, your presence and you are an inspiration. So thank now you. What, yes. yes. What is next? What is next is if you were moved, if you were inspired as I was by Heather's remarks, then you will have the opportunity to invite others to hear them. After the conclusion of this show, we will send a link to the recording that you can share with others. And particularly, we're going to re-show it without Heather, of course, at 7.30 this evening for folks who couldn't uh, join us at this particular time. And hopefully we'll be able to answer some of their questions about at least what we're doing here in Michigan. And then come to the movie free uh, Monday night, seven o'clock, and there will be organizations there in the afterglow that would love to have your support. And there'll be lots of constructive things that you can learn about and then sign up for. So with that, I thank you all for attending. And once again, thank you, Heather. It was really nice to thank meet you. Thank you, Charles. Bye. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Heather.